Hi, welcome to another episode of You're Kind of a Big Deal. And on this day that has blue skies, maybe a little snow, my guest today is Mr. Bud Abbott, who is going to jump us back in history. We're going to start in 1932, and he is going to tell you the rest of his incredible story. I sparkle. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, you know, uh, the new Pope just said there's a divine spark in each of us. I just read that this morning. I'm like, see, I knew that already. That's why I wear my sparkle thing. Absolutely. I know. And Absolutely. You have lots of sparkle in, you, in your eyes, in your life. So we're going to jump into history for all the people who um, love history and, and some untold stories of World War II. Good. Well, this is a kind of a story in words and pictures of things that are not generally known, but it's, it's a matter of how history repeats itself if we're not careful, or how we can just let it happen. And back in 1932, a man by the name of Adolf Hitler came on the scene in Europe. And Adolf Hitler was kind of a, uh, uh, a, a group organizer. And uh, Germany was going through the prongs of the aftermath of World War I, and they were devastated, they lost. And the German people were devastated, and they were hungry, and there was really no, nothing to eat. And so there was a lot of gangs, mobs moving around, and uh, there was a group of uh, uh, ruffians, and they, they started different parties because they, they wanted something to eat. They wanted something for their families. And so they were known basically as the Brown Shirts. And so a fellow by the name of Adolf Hitler uh, became one of them. And he helped organize them. And he was not uh, thought of as too much of a leader, except he was a great speaker. And uh, the president of Germany was a fellow by the name of von Hindenburg. And he saw this fellow Hitler and what he could do in uh, bringing people together to, to riot. And he felt that the best thing for him to do was to bring Hitler into his group. And so he invited Hitler into his group, to uh, hoping that Hitler would kind of calm down. But in less than six months, Hitler not only turned it around, he took over. And then von Hindenburg passed away, and Hitler started his, his reign, so to speak. And what happened with that was that Hitler wanted to preside more and more for the down under, the, uh, the underclass, uh, the less educated. And to feed them, because they always wanted more, was that he took from the rich. And what he wanted to do was to bring everybody up from the uh, low level to the middle class. And by doing that, well, then he attacked the upper class. And then when they took everything that the upper class had, well, then Hitler was looking around for another class. And he uh, went after the Jewish people because they were very frugal and uh, they had some great shops and Hitler took over them too. And as a matter of fact, if the Jewish people resisted, then he had a way of dealing with them. He just kind of sent them away and many of them were never heard of again. So anyhow, uh, Hitler started his way, and he decided that hey, after he took over Germany, he decided, well, this didn't pay the bills, and so then he started to um, uh, dilute the currency, the Reichsmark. And during this time, the uh, Reichsmark became almost worthless. You could buy shovels of, of uh, Reichsmark to get a loaf of bread. But that wasn't enough, and so what he decided to do then was, since he had these mobs of the brown shirts, he then took over other, uh, other countries, because this became his police force. And so he took over Austria, and he took over Czech Czechoslovakia, and they in turn became part of Germany. Well, the rest of the European countries did not care for this at all. So. Uh, Hitler decided, well, he has to start 
invading other countries, and he did. And he took over Holland and the Netherlands, and uh, England was really the only country left as to who can stop Hitler. But uh, a fellow there by the name of Neville Chamberlain, who was the Prime Minister of England, went over to Europe to meet Hitler. And he got Hitler's assurance on a handshake that Hitler would never invade or go to war with England so long as England did not interfere with Germany. And so Neville Chamberlain came back and with the historical words of peace in our time. Well, if you're a historian at all, you find out this lasted about six, about six months at most. Well, then another fellow came onto the scene, a fellow by the name of Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill was a dynamite guy. He took no nonsense from anybody. And he didn't believe what Hitler was going to do. And he prepared then for what he thought Hitler was going to do. And so he mobilized England. And he told the English people that what they will do is they will fight on the beaches, they will fight on the shores. They will never give up. Never, ever give up. Well, this really got to Hitler. And he's going to show Winston Churchill and the English people that he will decide to uh, attack England. And he did so with his bombers. And so the, Eng the, Brit the uh, German Air Force then was called the Luftwaffe. And so he would send over streams of bombers to bomb England. And he did. He did daylight raids, night raids on such cities as Coventry and London and a lot of the bigger cities and he'd bomb them and there was practically no uh, military significance to him other than Hitler was going to show them. Well, what Churchill did was he mobilized the uh, English Air Force called the RAF and he uh, particularly noted a British fly flyer by the name of um, Baldwin, uh, or Baldwin, and what Baldwin was, it was a, a paraplegic, but he was a flyer, and in an accident, he lost both of his legs. And he wanted, he petitioned uh, Churchill to fly again. Well, Hitler, or um, Churchill was so desperate for flyers, he took them, and he became part of the British RAF. And so the British had the Hurricane and the Spitfire as their little fighter planes. And what you see here is the little fighter planes that England had. And you're looking there at what they call the Hawker Hurricane. And perhaps you might have heard of Princess Margaret. Princess Margaret was Queen Elizabeth's sister. And she went with a, uh, a, a commoner who was in the, R in the RAF. And his name was Neville, Ch not, uh, yeah, no, no, Neville, Ch uh, Neville Townsend. And so this picture depicts a bombing raid or a fighter plane coming back from England where they were over there trying to shoot down as many German planes as they could. And in the top plane, you see a Hawker Hurricane pretty well shot up. And just behind and below him is uh, Neville, T Neville Townsend's Hawker Hurricane where he shepherded him back so that the German Air Force will not pounce on this fella. Kind of interesting things about history which you might not have known about. Okay, we can put that one back there. Okay. And so then we had some, uh, uh, the, uh, we had a president by the name of Franklin Roosevelt. And Franklin Roosevelt wanted to help best he could, but without putting America in, in the fight. And, and he did, he called it Lend-Lease. And so we loaned England destroyers, actually 50 destroyers, and some planes. And some of the planes that we had then were planes like I'm going to show you. You want to hand me that one, please? Okay. Yeah. Planes like this. And the plane you're going to see now is a Mustang, a P-51 Mustang. And incidentally, this is a plane I was learning to fly in World War II. And it's a... One whale of a fighter, let me tell you. And in it, you see up here a Messerschmitt 109. And on the wings of that 109 is a German pilot. But you'll notice that 
the pilot here in the Mustang is riding along behind. And what he's basically telling the pilot of the Messerschmitt is, bail out, or I'm going to shoot you down. And this is part of the, you can put it back now, this okay. is part of the nobility of the pilots back in those days, that we were not butchers. We wanted to shoot down planes, but we didn't want to kill anybody. And it shows there that the German pilot on the wing of that Messerschmitt 109, well, he better bail out. <laughs> And that's exactly what happened. And when our fighters would go up, we'd go up in pairs. And you probably heard of Wingman. You want to hand me this picture now, please? Yes. And later in the war, this is a picture of the P-51 Mustang and another one of the P-51 Mustang because they would fly in pairs. And they do it that way so that if they encountered a German plane, that no matter what the German plane did, he could go right or left, it didn't matter, but his wingman would go the opposite way. And to fire on a German plane, you had to be pointed right to him. So you can see here that this one is attacking, that's a Messerschmitt 262. And the Messerschmitt 262 was the first jet, and the, the uh, Luftwaffe had it. It was 150 miles an hour faster than the Mustang. So that was a big advantage, but if you had them in two, uh, together, at least you stood a fighting chance. And the only way you can actually get uh, a 262, much the jet, was either on landing or takeoff. But it was important for us to kind of get as many of those as we could. And this kind of shows a 262 going down in flames. Okay, you want to put them down now? I will. And we had some very interesting fellows on the ground. And I'm going to show you a picture here of a friend of mine. This is Clarence Olson, and Clarence Olson drove the tanks over in Europe. And so Clarence and his tank got lost over there in Europe, and when he finally found himself, he came out on a German airport. And there on the airport was a squadron of Luftwaffe fighters. And so what he did with his tank is he just opened up on them. Well, and so there you see him and you can see what's left of the German Air Force that is left on the airfield. Okay, I'll tell you a little bit about how they counted things for different awards. In the uh, RAF and in uh, the American Air Force when we finally got into war, if you shot down five planes, you were a, a, an ace. But if you, shot, if you were in the German Air Force, if you shot down 25 planes, you, you would get what they call the Knight's Cross. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that later on. But there's a, another plane I want to show you, and it's this one here. Hopefully you can get that. But this is a bomber, a B-17, returning from a fight over Europe. And this bomber, B-17, carries a crew of 10. And in the ACAC anti-aircraft guns and in the fighters that attacked them, he got pretty well shot up. Lost one engine. You can probably see there if we, on the picture that uh, that plane is in bad shape. And one thing that was lost was its compass. And so it just happened to fly over a German airfield. And so the German commander sent up this Messerschmitt to shoot this bomber down. And when the bomber, when the pilot got up there, he just could not shoot down this man. He said, this is like shooting a man in a parachute. And there's something about World War II pilots, and I'm such proud to be part of them, is that there is a nobility. There's certain things you just do not do. And the German pilot could see how badly shot up that B-17 was, and not only because he was going the wrong way, and he figured out because of his compass, so he rolled around and came up alongside the pilot's side of this B-17, and through hand motions, let him know, you want to go to England that way, not the way you're going. And he did. And so this is kind of a famous scene, because what you see there is a German fighter plane, I managed to spend 109, very capable of knocking this plane down. 
but turning this fellow around and getting back to England. Well, years later, the pilot of this B-17, a fellow by the name of uh, Charlie Brown, wanted to find out who was the pilot of that German plane. And after the war, a lot of us got back and had uh, a chance to meet the fellows from the other side. And I had occasion to do this too. And this fella, Charlie Brown, somehow found who was this pilot in the, in the uh, Luftwaffe that had turned him loose and helped him get back. And there's their picture. He found Franz Steigler, and that's him, 26 years old. He had already shot down 25 planes, I mean 24 planes. He was just one plane short of getting the Knight's Cross, which would have been a big deal for the Luftwaffe. And this is Charlie Brown, the B-17 pilot. Now these are just kids. Can you imagine? 25, 26 years old. So he did find them, and they did get back together. And when they got back together, let's see if I have a picture of them. I do. And here they are, 25 years later. Steiger, yeah, came to the United States and lived. And that is he right there. And this is Charlie Brown right there. And they got together with their crews because these are the crews that would not have made it had it not been for Steigler helping him to get across the channel. And I think, you know, that's, again, it's part of the, the, the nobility, which I'm so proud of to have been part of. Okay, we'll put that one down now. Okay. This looks like you. Yes. <laughs> When I first went into the Air Corps, we have a different kind of a, uh, of a civilization now in the United States. When Japan bombed Pearl Harbor in 1941, they completely gutted our Navy. And we were helpless. The only ships we had left of any consequence were aircraft carriers, and they were all at sea. And so we wanted to somehow get back to Japan. But to do so is, we have no bases near Japan. The closest one was probably 2,000 miles away in Hawaii, and Japan just cleaned us out. So President Roosevelt and a few other Army officers uh, came up with this plan of, let's try to find a way to bomb Tokyo. How are you going to do that? Anyhow, we're going to show you the crew of uh, a B-25 bomber. Oh, where's, here we are. This is a plane that actually bombed Tokyo. What is it? It's a B-25 Mitchell bomber. It is a mid-range bomber. It's not a bomber that's going to take off from an aircraft carrier, but they took 16 of these planes. They were taken down to Florida, and they had 16 crews, all volunteers, to learn how to take it off in the field, in a uh, aircraft carrier, the length of an aircraft carrier. And they did just that. So when they boarded the aircraft carrier, the Hornet, famous aircraft carrier, they came within 600 miles of Japan. Their plan was to get within 500 miles of Japan to where they could safely bomb Japan and go on to China and land. Well, when they got 600 miles out, they were spotted by some Japanese uh, trawlers. And they knew that, uh-oh, the jig is up, they're going to be spotted. And so they decided right then and there, they either have to go back to the United States or bomb Japan from that point. And they all decided, let's try it. And so can you imagine the crews and how they might have felt knowing, taking off from an aircraft carrier, heading for Japan, a different culture than ours altogether, knowing that there's no place to land, there's no way to come back, and maybe they could make it to China. Maybe. So that's what exactly happened. So if you have a chance to watch the movie 30 Seconds Over Tokyo, you'll see this. And you'll see some of the men that they uh, that manage these bombers. 
you know, it, it really kind of gave the United States a shot in the arm when they needed it the most. And, they, and we did need it the most at that point in time. Okay, I'll let you put this one back. Okay. I, did I talk about this picture? Yes, you okay, did. Okay, I did. Good. And so then, after the war, I had a chance to meet some of the other fellows from the other side. And you want to hand me that big picture? Yes. Right here. Thank you. After the war, I was to a fighter pilots convention out in Las Vegas. And so I met the fellow you see there, right there. His name is Adolf Galland. Adolf Galland was in charge of all of the German aircraft, the whole Air Force. And, and he, Adolf Galland had shot down over 105 of our planes. You know, when our planes are going over to bomb Germany, that's what they did. They, they bombed Germany and, and anything else they could find. And so Germany had the opportunity or the capacity. The, uh, they had to go up and, and, and fight the bombers. So there was no, no 25 missions for them to become uh, an ace. They had to go up as long as they were there to try to fight our, our bombers. Well, he, he shot down 105 of them. And for each one he shot down, that's a hundred and you know ten ten guys in each plane, and there was only one in the fighter. So anyhow, I had the privilege of meeting Adolf Gallen. Now, who is Adolf Gallen? Do you want to hand me that other picture? Yes. And a book. All right. There we go. Okay. There's a picture of Adolf Gallen when he was the commander of the Luftwaffe. And you'll notice around his neck is a cross. That's the Knight's Cross. And what a guy he is. And on his plane, on his Messerschmitt, he had a cartoon of Mickey Mouse. Germany's Mickey Mouse was altogether different from our Mickey Mouse. <laughs> but this is how you would identify other planes up in the air, is how was their planes made out? And so we knew who their aces were they knew who ours was. And so they knew about Bader, the fellow without the legs, and, uh, and what he had done. And, notice, and particularly since he's now flying with artificial legs for the RAF. And what was interesting is that Bader got shot down over Germany. And Adolf Gallen heard that Bader was one of their prisoners of war. And so he sent for Bader and had him come out and meet the German pilots that shot him down. And Bader said, well, can I sit in your, one of those Messerschmitts? Just take it around the field a couple of times. But they didn't think that was a very good idea. Really <laughs> no, and so it was kind of interesting. Is here it is how one side meets the other side when you're not fighting each other. And so Bader escaped. As a matter of fact, before he escaped, he left word with Galan to drop a note to the RAF. Would they please drop off on the next bombing run a pair of artificial legs, which they said they would do. And then later during the war, Galan was captured. And so Bader invited Galan to come over and meet the uh, RAF pilot that had shot him down. It was just kind of an interesting thing that you, you don't hear about. No, you wouldn't hear no, about it. No, 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 no. Arch enemies. Yep. Now, we're going to fast forward a little in time. Okay. This is you and not a fighter plane. No. You have still your pilot's license. Oh, yes. Still have my pilot's license, still have my, my instrument ticket, which is among pilots is very difficult to get to. And once I was in service and I started to learn how to fly, I was hooked. I just had to keep it up, and I did. I have now over 8,000 hours of flying time. And my last plane was what you see here. It's a Mooney 201. And the Mooney 201 is the closest thing to a fighter plane that you're going to find. And so, and then a couple years ago, one of my friends flew this, and he flew it into the ground. And that took care of my airplane 
that took care of him. You don't fly airplanes into the ground. No, but that's why you love the song Blue Skies. Oh, yes. Because you can't a... fly a plane when there's not blue skies. Right. You can, but it's not very helpful. <laughs> well, Bud, this has been fascinating. And you are like a history book live in person. And I absolutely love that. So I think we're going to have to have you come back and tell us some more stories <laughs> of all these amazing things. Okay, one more story. This is a more current story of your friend, if she will allow you to tell the story. When you landed in Oklahoma, you had to make an emergency landing. Oh. Oh, yeah. Yes. This is kind of a hilarious story. If you're comfortable telling oh, it. Oh, of course. One of my friends was flying back to Detroit. I kept my plane at Pontiac Airport. And halfway ha back, she says, hey, bud, I've got to go to the bathroom. Well, my little Mooney is very fast, but it's very cramped. It's like a four-seater sports car. And so when you're flying instruments like I was, you're always talking to somebody on the ground. And so I told the, uh, my aircraft controller at this point in time that we had an emergency. As soon as you say an emergency to anybody in the air, Boy, they drop everything because that means you, you've got to do something. And so I, I informed them that I had an emergency, but it really wasn't a real emergency, but it was a personal emergency that one of the ladies had to go to the bathroom. I could hear them laughing in the background. And they said, well, okay, up ahead about 20 miles is a, another city, uh, Asheville, Kentucky. And they said, we have already contacted Asheville, Kentucky, and they are expecting you. And when you get there, you don't have to make an instrument approach. They're going to clear you for straight in. And that's what we did. We went straight in at Asheville, Kentucky. And when we got there, the tower was waiting for us. And they cleared us all the way from the landing strip up to where the tower was to where there was some emergency <laughs> bathrooms. <laughs> Now, did you forget to tell me a, a part of the story? Didn't you tell them you were a World War II pilot? Oh, well, that was another story. Oh! Oh, that's another story. So anyhow, they, I let my, uh, my friend out, and she made it just in time, and they brought her back, but they, every time I get down that way, they, they kind of remind me. But, oh, yes, when, uh, what Peggy's referring to there is, I have a daughter out in California. I love little girls, as you know from little Margaret. And so my little girl now is 60 years old. Can you, believe, can you believe that, a kid like me having a daughter that's 60 years old? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> and so I'm flying over Amarillo, Texas, which is one of the places that I did my training. And it was getting late at night. And I contacted the tower and I said, you know, I would like to land there, but this is an Army airfield. You just don't go landing there. You have to do, have permission. Otherwise, they direct you to some civilian airport. And they said, you were here? And I said, oh, yeah, I had some of my fighter plane trial, um, pilot training there. And, they, and I could hear him talking down to the radar room that, hey, we have a World War II pilot coming in. And I could hear the excitement. They didn't expect to see anybody, particularly of my age, a World War II pilot. And so they said, yes, come on in. So I came in. And I was treated royally. And the following day when I got up, they took me out to the field, and here they had all these fighter trainers. These are all jets. When I was flying airplanes back in World War II, we didn't have any jets. Germany did. We all had propellers. But on these, in this Amarillo Army Airfield, they had jets. The two-seater jets that uh, you could sit on and take your training. And so they put me in one, and they said, Now, bud, you know, make yourself comfortable here, but whatever you do, don't touch this red handle. Well, what was that red handle? That red handle was the ejection seat, <laughs> which is a good thing, because if I had touched that, I would have gone through the roof up a couple hundred feet. <laughs> and so I didn't have to do that. And so one of the pictures we might have here is these planes and me sitting in it. Thank you. Hey, my pleasure, Peggy. Blue skies. And how? Blue skies. All right.